the later one. This is going to be 8.1, Securing the Republic. Uh, we're going to be looking mostly at the Washington administration in this uh, part of the chapter right here. And we're going to start with a quote from Alexander Hamilton who said, Learn to think continentally. Uh, I think that sounds like a pretty fun little quote there for some reason. Anyway, so uh, we have a constitution. Constitution says we need to have a president. So let's get ourselves a president, shall we? On April 30th, 1789, George Washington was elected unanimously the first president of the United States ever, and he took office in New York City. Um, and he was ruling over a time where America seemed, if possible, the most united it's ever been. At that time, at least, there were no political parties. There were political differences, but there were no political parties. However, we do see that this sort of utopic dream that everybody is going to get along together and there's never going to be any sort of like fights or anything like that um it quickly breaks up into factionalism party disputes um problems over the direction of our country and how we should govern so uh very quickly we see divisions start to form uh soon after washington uh takes power and especially after he leaves office so here is Federal Hall. This is the site of Washington's inaugural address back in uh, uh, 1789 in, in New York City. I mean, not 17. Yeah, 1789 in New York City. There we go. So, uh, yeah, this is Federal Hall downtown. This is actually on Wall Street these days, so it's still there. <clears throat> and here's our first president, George Washington. He was a two-term president. We'll talk about what that means later on in the chapter. But he was president from 1789 to 1797. From Virginia, where he was a farmer, a soldier, he was a delegate to the Second and First Continental Congress, he was the commander of the American forces during the Revolutionary War, so he had quite a lot of uh, prestige at this time. He was really the only choice. Uh, to be the president of the United States at this time. And a fun fact about him, he's known for his false teeth. Um, what we know about them is that they were made from human teeth, ivory, hippopotamus bone. Uh, however, as far as we can tell, George Washington did not have wooden teeth. Uh, so says the legend, the legend is not true, so far as I know, in this situation. Now, Washington was a symbol of unity. That's what I was talking about, that basically he was the only one who could have been the uniter at this time. People had a lot of differing opinions, but they agreed on Washington. Uh, he also did a lot of firsts. Uh, he created a cabinet. Uh, the cabinet are the people who are the heads of large government departments, like at that time, Secretary of War, Secretary of State, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and he filled them with the best people that he had on hand. Uh, and they became his sort of unofficial advisors in a lot of ways. He also established the Supreme Court with six members, uh, including John Jay as the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, and so we see this is sort of seen as, again, this sort of time of great unity, at least on the surface. Uh, however, that unity would not hold for very long. So here is the first cabinet with uh, George Washington as the president. His secretary of war was his old artillery chief from the American Revolution, the guy in charge of the cannons, Henry Knox. Secretary of the Treasury was Alexander Hamilton. Secretary of State was our probably our best diplomat at the time, Thomas Jefferson, except maybe for John Jay, who became the Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice. And then our Attorney General was Virginian Edmund Randolph, who had suggested the Constitution in the first place. So this is the first cabinet we ever had. We now have many more cabinet members, by the way. So this is John Jay. He was uh, alive from 1745 to 1829. Nice long life. Uh, he is from New York City. He had been part of the Second Continental Congress. He went abroad uh, to uh, sort of iron out the peace treaties between the United States, England, and France. Um, and he is also our first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He, along with uh, Madison and Hamilton, helped to write the Federalist Papers, although he got sick pretty quickly and didn't write very many of them. Uh, and he ended up retiring from the Supreme Court to become the governor of New York. Uh, so he did not live out the rest of his life on the bench. Now, what broke up the love fest? 
in a word or two words, Alexander Hamilton broke up the love fest. If there was a person who divided our nation, it was probably Hamilton. The nation was going to divide anyway. Uh, we were always going to have factionalism and political parties to a certain degree, but Hamilton definitely helped speed it up a little bit and his financial plan. So Hamilton was a federalist. He was a firm federalist. He believed in big government. He believed uh, in nationalism. Um, and he believed that the best way to make America financially stable was to get other people uh, both inside and outside of the country to invest in our country. And the way he wanted to do this to make our uh, country look financially viable and like a place where you'd want to put your money is he said we can't have a bunch of like debts from every individual state. It looks like we're 13 little states and not one big nation. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to have the United States government take over the debts of all the different states um, and to basically control them. And that would make us look more like a legit country. So he also wanted to create a national bank of the United States that could hold public funds, issue paper money, loan money to the United States. Um, again, it makes us look more legit. He also wanted to, he did a lot. This is a lot, by the way. So he wanted to create a national tax on a specific good. This is what we call an excise tax. Uh, and of the things that he wanted to tax, he decided that the best thing to tax would be sort of a luxury good, which is whiskey. Uh, we will talk about that later on, the uproar that that created. Uh, lastly, he also wanted to create a tax on foreign goods, on tariffs coming into our country so that American people would have to buy more American goods during this time. Now, Hamilton's plan would have given so much more power to the federal national government, uh, and it was popular among the Federalists, including George Washington, uh, and wealthy merchants, industrial manufacturers, people who lived in big cities liked it in general. However, it angered his enemies, and it's not just because of what he said, although it was definitely what he said too, but Hamilton was a guy who you either loved or you hated. There was very little, like, middle ground with Hamilton. Um, and for them, for people who didn't like it, it looked like it was going to increase our reliance on international trade, especially with England. Um, and a lot of these guys are sort of like, we're not so sure about like setting up these trade deals with foreign countries and things like that. Uh, the whole plan looked very British, too. The whole national bank sounded like a British idea. Um, and to guys like Jefferson and Madison, they said, look, America's future doesn't... Uh, it's not in the big cities. It's not with merchants and international trade. It is with farming and westward expansion. That is where the money is going to live. Um, and so uh, eventually this came to a head, this, this fight between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. His opponents were also uh, very worried about the plan to create a large standing army uh, in order to deal with any sort of Shays' rebellions of the future, because if you could create a huge standing army that would last, um, it could be turned against the people, was the fear. And all in all, anti-federalists in general just believe this plan would introduce corruption into our government. In the minds of some anti-federalists, especially Jefferson, uh, all banks are corrupt in the minds of Jefferson. Um, he also believed that banks were just out to uh, steal the money of poor farmers, um, and also that it would hurt poor farmers because poor farmers generally didn't keep their crops in crop form. They would reduce them and turn them into other things, including whiskey. Um, whiskey was great because it sold for high prices. Um, and so basically they were worried that this would uh, hurt the farmers, that it was designed to hurt the farmers, um, and also that eventually this would lead us right back into English hands uh, instead of creating a self-sustaining nation. Now, the American South, I mean, adding to the list of many people who are unhappy with, with Hamilton at this time, uh, the American South was unhappy because the federal government was assuming the debts of the states. So it was no longer, you know, Maryland has debt and South Carolina has debt. Now it is all of these debts are being sucked into the federal government. Um, and this was bad for the South because in order to pay off these debts, they would have to tax the people. But the South said, we've already paid off our debts, most of them, in fact, quite almost all of them. 
Um, now, why should we have to pay taxes in order to pay off the debts of states in the North who have not been as successful at paying off their debts as the South has? Now, another big issue for people who uh, are uh, strict constructionists when they look at the Constitution, people who read it word for word, uh, is that the Constitution technically does not have, um, as one of its powers for the federal government, the power to create a national bank. And there were some people who believed the federal government should stop where the Constitution stops, that they shouldn't sort of like... Uh, read too much further into the Constitution that um, they shouldn't be looking for powers that are not written down, even if they're sort of implied in certain ways. However, Hamilton believed that the Constitution did give this uh, power to the government, not explicitly, but implicitly, because the Constitution does say that the federal government has the power to do whatever is quote-unquote necessary and proper. And this necessary and proper clause is a huge loophole for Hamilton, big enough to drive a national bank through in the mind of Hamilton. And so it looked like Hamilton's plan was not going to go through because the Anti-Federalists didn't like it and didn't like him. Uh, and so in the end, Hamilton cut a deal with the Anti-Federalists. Um, the famous story of Hamilton going to having went and had dinner uh, over at Thomas Jefferson's house with Jefferson and Madison. Uh, and the Virginians, nobody was in the room where it happened except for those three. But the idea was that the Virginians would give him the financial plan that he wanted uh, as long as he provided the votes from New York and the North to uh, create a new national capital. And they wanted it on the Potomac River between Virginia and Maryland. They hoped that having a southern nation's capital would give the southerners a bit more power. And so uh, this is the plaque on the side of Thomas Jefferson's house in, Washington, in uh, New York City. Uh, it no longer stands, but the, uh, the giant skyscraper that is in its place still has this uh, for the room where it happened. Uh, and yes, I'm going to, gosh darn it, I'm going to keep quoting Hamilton. You cannot stop me. Anyway, both sides got what they wanted. Hamilton got his bank. The South got the nation's capital. The side of Washington, D.C. was surveyed. It was put out. Uh, they started building the District of Columbia during Washington's term. Washington never actually lived in Washington, D.C. It wasn't until John Adams, uh, our second president, that we had a president who occupied the White House. And it was still under construction at the time. So here is Washington, D.C. It is in between Maryland and Virginia. That fact is going to be very important when we get to the Civil War in a little bit. So international disputes ended up dividing our nation into parties, along with the disputes that were already happening with uh, federalism versus anti-federalism. We also had questions of uh, international problems going on. And one of these problems started right about the same time that Washington took power, right about 1789. Uh, France had followed America into the revolutionary period. France had their own French Revolution. And most Americans were like, yeah, way to go, way to, way to stand up for it like we did. But then in 1793, they executed King Louis, and they executed his wife, Marie Antoinette, and then people took over who just started chopping off heads kind of willy-nilly. Uh, this was called the Reign of Terror. Tens of thousands of Frenchmen were sent to the guillotine during this time. And Jefferson and his followers, uh, the Anti-Federalists, they may not have liked all the death and destruction going on, but they said, these are sort of the birthing pains of a new republic. Uh, this death is leading towards something. It was a necessary step on the path towards creating a republican government in France. Hamilton and his followers said, they're killing people, left and right. They killed the king. Um, and so Federalists like Hamilton and Washington basically thought that this was anarchy, this was lawlessness taking over, uh, and this helped to uh, push uh, America closer to Great Britain, at least while the Federalists were in charge. Jefferson, however, from France, said the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of t patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. He actually said that uh, earlier about... Um, the uh, rebellion, the the uh, 
the guy's rebellion in, in, in Massachusetts, whose name I'm blanking on right now because I'm old. Shay's Rebellion, there we go. This is a Shay's Rebellion quote, but uh, it definitely uh, is his viewpoint of the uh, French Revolution as well. So, French allies of Thomas Jefferson, including the French emissary to the United States, a guy named Edmund Genet, who went by the name Citizen Genet, which is a very French Republic kind of name, uh, they were pushing America to get involved, uh, send troops uh, to, Fran to help out France, because it looks like France and England are about to get into a, uh, a fight. So, why don't you send some troops our way, they said. Uh, meanwhile, the British were taking American ships out of the Caribbean, kidnapping American sailors. This is called impressment. It's going to become important during the War of 1812. And it looked like America was going to have to pick a side between France and England. We were going to have to choose which side we're on. Now, in the end, John Jay, who is uh, our first uh, chief justice, but also our chief ambassador at the time, created a very controversial treaty known as Jay's Treaty that uh, basically ended our alliance with France. They were our chief ally during the American Revolution, so this angered a lot of anti-federalists. Uh, it also made a lot of concessions to England, basically saying, you know, we promise to do this, we promise to do that. Um, and also, in the end, Washington decided he was going to take no side during this time, when England and France are gearing up to fight each other, um, he basically said, yeah, we're staying out of European affairs in this one. We're not getting involved. So here is the impressment of American soldiers during that time. Now, the political, uh, I'm sorry, the ideological divisions uh, between these two groups eventually caused a split into two separate parties. We have the Federalists and we have the Republicans, uh, also known as the Democratic Republicans. So this is not to connect them to the modern Republican Party. Uh, the Federalists were adherents to the, they, they liked the idea of a bigger federal government. Um, they wanted closer ties with Great Britain. We thought they were more stable, more reliable. Um, they were generally wealthier, uh, a lot of merchants and businessmen in the Federalist Party. Uh, and they saw the French Revolution um, as basically what happened when a revolution is going wrong. Uh, and that it had broken apart and was now just lawless anarchy and killing in the streets. So this is a Federalist cartoon showing infant liberty nursed by mother mob, that basically uh, the people, the mob, are uh, feeding, breastfeeding this, this infant liberty in France, and so the mob is just, as you can see in the background, tearing down buildings. Now, Federalists were also very worried about American people sort of looking at the French Revolution as an example, uh, as a, uh, something to follow. Uh, and so we were very worried about another, you know, revolutions are all well and good as long as they're not happening to you. Uh, and so in 1794, the federal government was very worried because um, a rebellion broke out in Pennsylvania over uh, Hamilton's new excise tax on whiskey. And this whiskey rebellion used a lot of symbols of the American Revolution. They used a lot of sort of slogans of no taxation without representation. Uh, they were also a lot of veterans in the field. Uh, however, Washington and Hamilton and the Federalists did not view this as sort of a continuation of the American Revolution. He thought it was more French lawlessness coming to our land. And so George Washington himself raised an army of militiamen and marched them into battle. Uh, however, when he got to the battle f battlefields of Pennsylvania, uh, the enemy was not there. They basically met with no resistance. Um, the people cheered when they saw Washington heading their way, and so the Whiskey Rebellion sort of faded. But it really does show the power of the federal, the, this new federal government that's coming out. So here's an anti-whiskey political cartoon where the devil is taking the whiskey right there, as you can see. Now, the Republicans, who were led by Madison and Jefferson, were more in favor of closer ties to France. Uh, they mainly had smaller, poorer farmers on their side and some wealthy Southerners as well. Um, they had faith in the ability of the common man, the regular man, that um, people should have more power than the federal government to make political decisions, um, that the normal person should. 
Uh, both parties, however, considered themselves the real American, though, and both sides were accusing each other of treachery and treason and corrupting the original intentions of the revolution. We're still at the founding fathers, period, but they're all saying, you know, you're sort of, you're, you're messing up the, what we fought for back in the, uh, 1776. Now, the rise of political parties also led to a rise of common people in the United States expressing their opinions uh, speaking up for what they believed in. Uh, they would write pamphlets, they wrote newspapers. Remember, this is a time where a lot of newspapers are being created. Uh, they joined clubs devoted to their parties. Um, there were about 50 Democratic Republican societies created in the 10 years, or in the one year, I'm sorry, uh, that uh, this was all happening. Now, most of these societies disappeared after the Whiskey Rebellion. They kind of melted away with the, the rebels. Uh, it showed this growing desire for everyday people to have a voice in the political uh, questions of the day. They did not just want their higher-ups to be making the decisions. They did not just want the people who might consider themselves their quote-unquote betters making all the decisions. They wanted their voice in there, too. Now, this time, uh, when we see a more a rise of like Republican thinking, it also led... Uh, to the question of, should women have more rights as well? Um, do women deserve to have a vote, for instance? And we see that some women are starting to uh, call for this as well. So in 1792, we have an, a British author, a woman named Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote uh, the, A Vindication for the Rights of Women. Uh, this was based on the writings of Thomas Paine. So she, again, we see sort of these American Revolution uh, writings are sort of fanning the flames of revolutionary ideas around the world. Uh, and she called for paid work for single women uh, in, and maybe even voting rights if we're going that far. Uh, we also see Judith Sargent Murray of Massachusetts writing articles for newspapers. Uh, she did not use her own name. That would have been a little too gauche. But she uh, wrote... Uh, a, an article called On the Equality of the Sexes, and in it she argued that women should be allowed to use all the gifts, all of their gifts, equally to men, and they were just as smart, just as dedicated, just as patriotic. Um, the problem was that they were denied the right to education, and that's the only thing holding them back. So give women more rights and more education, and we will be equal to men, basically, is what she was saying. So here's Mary Wollstonecraft, who said, I do not wish women to have the power over men, but over themselves. And here's Judith Sargent Murray, who said, Yes, ye lordly, ye haughty sex, our souls are by nature equal to yours. The same breath of God animates, enlivens, and invigorates us. So this is why she's saying that women should have equal rights to men. <laughs> 